Good morning. Welcome to this morning's service, and a especially warm welcome to anybody who may be joining us for the first time. And if you are new, Self-Realization Fellowship was founded in 1920 by Paramahansa Yogananda. Lake Shrine itself was dedicated in, uh, and opened by SRF in 1950. And one of the aims and ideals of Self-Realization Fellowship reads, to disseminate among the nations a knowledge of definite scientific techniques for attaining direct personal experience of God. And Paramahansa Yogananda's mission was to reintroduce the lost science of Kriya Yoga meditation because of its efficacy to allow us to do just that, attain a direct personal experience of God. Not a theory, not a f even beyond faith, but a direct personal experience of God. And Paramahansa Yogananda created a set of home study lessons that disseminate the various meditation techniques of the Kriya Yoga path, as well as its how to live teachings, which touch upon everyday topics that help us to spiritualize every aspect of our lives, that allows us to use every moment of our lives to move closer to the goal of self-realization, fulfillment of the highest purpose of life, self-realization. The topic for this morning's service is Awakening Divine Memory. And this is an example of these types of topics covered in the How to Live teachings that help us, again, spiritualize every aspect of our life so that, again, we're using every moment to move toward the goal of life, the goal of God-realization, self-realization, oneness with God. And with regard to awakening memory, there are two kinds of memory, human and divine. And it benefits us to consciously, deliberately work on cultivating, developing each kind. And such an effort will benefit every aspect of our life, not just our spiritual lives, but there's a lot of crossover. A better memory helps us on the spiritual path because we can concentrate better, which is needed in meditation. We can, through that memory, learn more, glean the lessons we're meant to learn through life's experiences and avoid the mistakes going forward. But a good memory benefits us as a student, it benefits our professional life, our family life, every aspect of our lives is benefited. And so by developing human memory and making the right use of the power of memory, we'll be better able to learn, as we said, from all life's experiences and hold on to the positive and powerful lessons we're meant to learn through all the experiences of life. And by developing our divine memory, we can not only learn the lessons from our everyday life, but from past lives. In a talk from Man's Eternal Quest titled The Art of Developing Memory, Paramahansaji said, by improving the quality of memory, we can make it powerful enough to remember all things, even our divine origin. By awakening the divine memory, whereby we can recall every experience of all our past lives and ultimately realize our immortal soul nature, salvation is attained. The purpose of life is gloriously fulfilled, and that sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> and so we'll get into this topic, but first let us stand and open the service with a prayer. Please fold your hands and let us pray from our hearts. Heavenly Father, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Bhagavan Krishna, Mahavatar Babaji, Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswar, and our Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, saints of all religions, 
we bow to you all. Divine Mother, bless all our efforts to develop the seeds of spiritual power and success that are within us and to use them to know, love, and serve thee in everything we do. Om. Peace. Amen. Please be seated. So, as we always do in Self-Realization Fellowship, we'll begin the service with a period of silent meditation. And if you're new, two things you need to know. And the first is just the proper posture. And today we're all sitting in chairs. At home you may sit in lotus posture, half lotus, cross-legged, but, or a chair. But wherever we're sitting, the goal is to sit with the spine erect for the duration of the meditation without tension or stress. So find a comfortable position, ideally with the spine away from the back of the chair. And then it's just good posture, so chins up parallel to the ground. Shoulders back, chest out, stomach in, hands at or near the junction of the thigh and the abdomen. And the other thing we have to know in meditation is we want to gently lift the gaze and hold the gaze gently uplifted also for the duration of the meditation. So we, we don't have, it's a gentle lifting of the gaze to the level of the point between the eyebrows. We just have to concentrate on lifting it and keeping the eyes gently uplifted for the duration of the meditation. If they start to fall, just pick them back up. And it, if you practice that for a few weeks, it'll become a habit to keep the eyes gently uplifted throughout the meditation. Our organist will lead us in a chant, listen, 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 which is on page nine, the words on page nine of the little blue chant booklet in the back of each chair. And so just follow along silently, mentally, and after he concludes, you can go on mentally chanting or then go into the practice of the techniques. And again, if you're new and you have no technique, just take some prayer to man that stirs the embers of your heart, like reveal thyself. And just repeat it silently, mentally. Reveal thyself. Reveal thyself. It's a, as a child of God, it's our right to have that direct personal experience of our Divine Mother. And so demand it. Reveal thyself. Reveal thyself. And as often as the mind wanders, and it will, you just deliberately, calmly bring it back. Reveal thyself. Reveal thyself. And in that simple discipline, you'll find that the distracting thoughts, which are generally going in a hundred different directions, start to slow down. Concentration begins to deepen. And a calmness, a peace, begins to grow within. And that peace ultimately is a piece we can tap into in the most uh, tense-filled, chaotic moments of our lives because it's not coming from anything from without. It's coming from God. It's coming from the soul. And that's always there for us to tap into, even in the most troubling and trying circumstances of our lives. So, and if the organist will lead us in the chant, let us assume the proper posture, lift the gaze, chant mentally.
Om. Peace. Amen. So the topic for this morning's service is Awakening Divine Memory. And if it weren't for memory, we would forget all the perceptions of life and have to start afresh every day like an infant. And back in the 1970s, there was a professional American football player. His name was Dwayne Thomas. He played for the Dallas Cowboys, and he was a eclectic personality. He was a different kind of cat. <laughs> and he was in training camp in Dallas, and that's these grueling two-a-day workouts. And so for one of the meals, he was in the cafeteria, and he got his tray, and he filled it up with milk and salad and vegetables, a mountain of mashed potatoes and a big slab of beef. And then he went to the cafeteria dining room to eat. And then he came back a few minutes later, and everything was gone except the slab of meat was untouched in the cafeteria crew said, oh, Mr. Thomas, is, is something wrong with the meat? And he said, oh, no, there's nothing wrong. I just remembered, I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> and without the power of memory, every day would be like that. <laughs> We'd have to le relearn how to brush our teeth, tie our shoes, drive, and so forth. Learn everything anew. And it's the result of the power of memory that we are able to do develop these habits for recurring events so that we don't have to learn anew each day. And as we touched on, it, that power of memory will help us to make greater use of our daily introspection, to really glean all the lessons all that we're meant and able to learn through life's experiences and then apply those, remember to apply those lessons when the similar circumstances come up in the future so we don't repeat our mistakes. Uh, memory helps us to become the best version of ourselves and ultimately, as we said earlier, fulfill the highest purpose of life, to recall and reclaim the realization of our divine nature, soul nature. And memory can be developed by exercising it. Just as we perform cardio exercise or strength training exercise to develop the body, we can and should uh, exercise the mind to develop the mind and in the process develop human and divine memory. And in Man's Internal Quest, chapter 47, there's a talk of Paramahansa called titled The Art of Developing Memory. And in that talk, he said, to develop a good memory, one should not only exercise the body and eat health-building food, but should also engage in mental discipline. Make an effort to remember things. Practice the art of visualization. Look at a certain object or at scenery and then try to reproduce that picture in your mind. Trying to recall the strains of songs and chants and singing them mentally develop, develops memory. Anything that is done with feeling or that rouses feeling develops memory. Both poetry and music have emotional values. All of us remember easily the greatest sorrows and the greatest joys of our lives. Why? Because those experiences were felt deeply. Anything that one strongly feels develops one's power of memory. Writing poetry and adding and subtracting mentally are also good methods for developing memory and concentration. He goes on and says, to increase one's power of memory, one should do everything with deep attention. Most people carry on their activities absentmindedly. There is a great gulf between their actions and their thoughts. That is why they cannot remember anything very well. What one wants to recall, he should perform with great attention. One should not be fussy, but whatever he undertakes should be done with his whole mind. In church, one should listen to the sermon with keen attention. <laughs> I'm not making that up. <laughs> 
work at tasks in the home with attention and interest. Keeping the conscious mind on the task at hand does not prevent one from reflecting constantly on God in the background of his mind. But when one meditates, he should think only of God. The power of memory is strengthened by meditation. We've all heard that saying, anything worth doing is worth doing well. And to do something well, we can't do it absent-mindedly. We do it with attention, we do it with concentration, we do it with feeling. And if we're doing some mundane chore that bores us, then we have to bring the feeling into it. It's up to us. That's our responsibility. So we can do that, for example, by doing it with God, for God, to God, in the presence of God, as an offering of love to God. That will bring in the feeling. That will bring in the attention. Then we'll do it well, and in the process, we'll be effectively exercising and strengthening our mind, our memory. And as we said, we have both that human memory and divine memory, and there's obviously a lot of crossover. We've already touched upon it between the two and developing the two. For example, Guruji concluded the thought we just read with the power of memory is strengthened by meditation. Not just that divine memory, but our human memory. Because the concentration is needed in meditation. Meditation, arguably, is the ultimate mental discipline. So it's going to help us develop the mind, help us develop human memory, just as much as divine memory. And Guruji said, to develop a good memory, one should not only exercise the body and eat health-building foods, but one should also engage in mental discipline. So by practicing self-control, we're, de we're developing our human memory, our divine memory, which we'll go into detail. There's a very powerful truth to that. It's expounded in today's Gita passage. But in the beginning of meditation, as one begins to meditate, it's far more of an exercise of concentration than it is of communion. Ultimately, the highest definition of meditation is communion with God. But in the beginning, again, the mind for lifetimes has been scattered and running in a hundred different directions. So we sit and try to concentrate it, and it's hard work. It's, it's an exercise in concentration. And again, that strengthens the mind. That's, that effort strengthens memory. Guruji said, to increase one's power of memory, one should do everything with deep attention. And there is no meditation without deep attention, without concentration. So we can see that crossover, how meditation helps develop human and divine memory, and how even things like mental discipline, self-control, help to develop human but also divine memory. And today's Bible passage touches on a, a deep principle. But to understand the Bible passage, it helps to remember that in the Bible, there's a big donut hole in Jesus' life. It talks about Jesus' life up till he's 15 years old, and then it, there's a big hole, big gap, and then it touches upon his life from ages 30 to 33. There's historical evidence, documentation, that as was custom of the time, uh, Jesus' parents arranged for him to be married. And he knew intuitively that wasn't to be his path. And so he traveled. He returned the visit of the wise men from the east that showed up at his birth. And there's documentation in Tibet and India of his visit and studying at the feet of the masters, learning a meditation, Kriya Yoga meditation, or a very similar pranayam technique of meditation. And that he brought that back but it wasn't his role. It was too low an age to teach meditation to the masses. But he did teach that pranayama technique of meditation to his apostles. And so this touches upon, you could say, the Trinity. Uh, most of us grew up in the West, understand in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. In India, there's something exactly the same, Om Tat Sat. And that name of the Father, the Father, God, cosmic consciousness, the Son, the Christ consciousness. 
and the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, the Om vibration. And all creation, in the Bible it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's the Om vibration. And that, it is the building block of all creation. Everything we see, can touch, uh, solids, liquids, gases, you know, different surfaces, concrete, wood, and so forth. It's all varying vibrations of the Om vibration. But it develops into all these various forms through some intelligence, and that is the sun, the Christ consciousness. That is the only pure reflection of God in creation. And that's what engineers and directs that vibration into the various forms. They, that the word, the own vibration, the Holy Ghost, is permeated with the Christ consciousness, the only pure reflection of God in creation. So this helps us to understand this Bible passage where Christ, I believe it was the Last Supper, said to his apostles, the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. And in his commentary from Second Coming of Christ, Paramahantaji said, Jesus reminded the disciples that the cosmic own vibration, or Holy Ghost, whose sound they heard within themselves through meditation, was not a manifestation of his power, of Jesus Christ's power, but of the Father's power, God's power the emanation of cosmic consciousness, which also reflected itself as the Christ consciousness present and manifested in Jesus. But it's present within each one of us and can be realized and manifested just as it was in Jesus' life through self-effort. Paramahansa goes on and says, Jesus revealed many truths to the disciples while he was present with them. But here, promised that when, by meditation, they contacted the Holy Ghost, the cosmic own vibration, made sacred by the presence of Christ's consciousness within it, they would know that the Father was sending that cosmic vibration, or comforter, in my name. Again, not in the name of Jesus Christ, but through the instrumentality of the Christ consciousness that it permeates the own vibration, the Holy Ghost. And from this holy vibration that they were to contact in meditation would emanate the great Christ bliss present in it to comfort them in all miseries. That's the comfort, that realization of God through the Christ consciousness. And it would comfort them just as it could comfort us. We're talking about in the meditation that that peace we contact is not coming from without. It's coming from within. It's coming from God. We can tap into it and use it feel that peace, that comfort, even during our greatest trials. And it was to comfort them in all their miseries, and it was fairly miserable to be a follower of Christ for the next several hundred years. They were persecuted, they were crucified, and yet, by going within, contacting the Om, contacting the Christ consciousness through that Om, they could be comforted, realizing that, oh yeah, they had a body, had a mind, but they are the soul, and the soul's untouched by anything this world can throw at it. And Paramahansa concludes by saying, Jesus further stated that the Christ-imbued cosmic own vibration would not only give them great comfort and bliss, but would bring them the knowledge of all things and recall from their memory the wisdom he had implanted within them. For the Holy Ghost is the source of all materialized creation and hence of all earthly and astral wisdom. So the Holy Ghost is the source of all materialized creation. As we said, it is the building block of everything in creation. But by contacting that Christ-imbued cosmic own vibration, they could intuitively connect with all wisdom present in God. And that is implanted in us as a child of God. It's there. We just got to remember it. And that's most efficiently achieved through meditation. So the power of even the limited human memory is tremendous. So through that, we can see, yes, it's possible through human, but more so divine memory, that we can tap into all remembrance, 
all that knowledge, all that wisdom, as a child of God, it is our birthright. God has implanted that within us. Omniscience, omnipresence, things that sound so far out and fanciful. It's within our grasp. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. We contact that. And to demonstrate the vast power of even the limited human memory, I think we're all aware of, remember, pi. It is the ratio between the circumference of any circle and the diameter of that circle. And it's a value that is used in formulas throughout physics and mathematics. And we might re we remember it as 3.14. That's the value of pi. And, but the digits of pi go on indefinitely with no known pattern. So it, it, you might say it's the ultimate litmus test of memory. The world record, the current world record for reciting digits of pi is 67,890 digits. <laughs> There's another memorist who recited 100,000, but evidently he didn't meet the protocols and criteria, so it's not in Guinness Book of World Records. But 67,890 digits somebody was able to recite. And back in 1981, the world record was set by a, an Indian fellow named Mahadevan and in, Bang, in Mangalore, India, he got up on stage on January 5th, 1981, and he repeated uh, 31,811 digits of pi. He first got through the first segment, which they say 768 digits long, and then he recited 10,000 digits before taking a break for a soft drink, <laughs> and then continued to recite digits of pi for three hours and 49 minutes. And finally, he stopped at 31,811. He commanded the tremendous power of that's human memory. And he was asked afterward why he stopped there. And he said, I just forgot the 31,812th digit. <laughs> He said, I'm always stumbling over that one. <laughs> but it illustrates the gargantuan capabilities of even the limited human memory, much less the power of divine memory. And it's not an isolated incident. The world-renowned conductor Arturo Toscanini was well known for his memory. He knew all the words and all the music for over a hundred operas. And he knew all the music, every note for every instrument in over 250 symphonic works. One night, whatever symphony he was traveling with, they were in St. Louis for a performance. And the second bassoonist came up to him, you know, whatever, a half hour before the performance, and was a little distraught. He said his lowest key on his bassoon had broken. So... Arturo Tusca Toscanini just stood there in silence for several minutes. And then he turned to the second bassoonist and said, don't worry, there are no G-flats in any of the pieces that we're playing tonight. <laughs> With no advance warning, he's able to mentally review not only every piece of music, every piece of music for the second bassoonist <laughs> and realize there's no G-flats, which evidently that key was either G-flat or was needed to make a G-flat. And the thing is, we all have that power within us. And again, how can we awaken that memory? And Gurji said, among other things, practice mental discipline. Practice self-control. And this relates to a deep principle of practicing this mental discipline, self-control in our lives from today's Gita passage, where Lord Krishna said, brooding on sense objects causes attachment to them. Attachment breeds craving. Craving breeds anger. Anger breeds delusion. Delusion breeds loss of memory of the soul. Loss of right memory causes decay of, de of the discriminating faculty. From that, the annihilation of the spiritual life follows. <laughs> That's a, a really negative cycle there. <laughs> but it all starts without 
practicing the mental discipline to be the master of our desires, the master of our emotions. We're all going to have desires and emotions, but we want to be the master of them. And in his commentary, Paramahansa Ji said, the evolution from sense attraction to destruction may thus be summarized as follows. Sense attractions, if not sublimated in the beginning, are bound to grow into desires. Obstruction of desires agitates the calmness of the consciousness and rouses a blinding confusion in the normally working mind. When, the, when this obscuring, obscuring fog arises in the average man, he loses memory of his own human dignity. And we could see a lot of that, perhaps in ourselves, but we see it in the world today. People have lost the memory of their own human dignity. The loss of memory confuses and blocks his discrimination, the motivating force of all right action. When the steering wheel of discrimination in the mental car of man's life is broken, he ends up in the ditch of uh, misery. <laughs> when discrimination is lost, then all motivating forces for right action. Again, we see that playing out. We've perhaps seen it play out in our own life from time to time, but we see it in the world. When the steering wheel of discrimination in the mental car of man's life is broken, he ends up in a ditch of misery. So practicing mental discipline to be master of our emotions, of our desires, is a very important and effective way to develop our human and divine memory. And as we set out to develop memory, we want to make sure we're always using its power properly, using it for good, because there are many ways to use the power of memory that won't benefit us, that won't benefit others. Again, from that same talk in Man's Eternal Quest, Paramahansa Ji said, memory was given to man to reproduce good. To, to abuse the power of memory is harmful. To think hatefully of another person because of some remembered injury he inflicted on you is a mis misuse of memory. And again, this isn't denial. He's not saying we don't introspect about certain exchange experience we had with a person. But we identify the lessons that need to be learned. And again, as a leader, as a parent, as a teacher, as a boss, a supervisor, we need to be aware of the flaws of others, and we don't want to expose ourselves unnecessarily to harm or mistreatment. But we're not obsessing on that. We want to look toward the good. We're aware of the bad, and then we want to look to the good, put people in a position to succeed, and if and when we can, put them in a position to transmute, transform their weaknesses into strengths. But again, the proper use of memory is to primarily we learn the lessons, but then, as it said, forget the experience, forget the bad experience, learn the lesson, hold on to the lesson. That's what we remember. The proper use of memory, though, is to recall the good, positive, loving, constructive, spiritual. Paramahansa goes on, he says, however, to recall unhappy experiences in order to learn the lessons inherent in them is a proper use of memory, as then one may analyze his past behavior and avoid repeating in future the wrong acts that brought painful results. One should not bring back any wrong thought and relive it, for then it will stay longer in the mind. Memory was given to us to keep alive only life's good experiences and lessons. Get rid of wrong past thoughts by avoiding recalling them. If they come to mind in spite of you, refuse to entertain them. Practice the mental discipline. Again, be, we are the gatekeepers of the thoughts we're going to allow into the kingdom of our mind. And again, this isn't denial. We need to be aware of our own flaws so we can map out a game plan on how to weed out those bad habits and qualities in ourselves. And we need to be aware of the flaws in others. So again, we don't expose ourselves unnecessarily to mistreatment or harm. But the proper use of memory primarily is to recall only the good, the positive, the loving. And it's, Paramahansa is really hammering this point. Then he goes on, he says, let me repeat. To remember bad experiences and dwell upon them is an abuse of God's gift to us of memory. Rather, one should vow 
I shall use memory only to recall good thoughts and experiences. From this moment, I banish from my mind all unpleasant memories. They belong to the mortal being. I am a child of spirit. I am going to see, hear, taste, touch, feel, and will everything that is good. I shall take only the good from my life's experiences and shall preserve only the good in my memory. And this, as everything we talk about, is easier said than done. This can be hard to do because people inevitably can disappoint us and, or worse, make us angry. But we're expected to make that effort to overcome, to transmute that anger and that disappointment. And again, be aware of the flaws, but uh, concentrate on the positive qualities of others. Concentrate on the strengths of others. Maintain a positive attitude toward others. And we're all different, and there's different tools and techniques that we can use to accomplish this, because again, it's not easy. And as Guruji mentioned, again, in that Gita commentary, anger is a major contributing factor to poor memory, and if unchecked, as he said, leads to the, the destruction of one's spiritual life, leads to the destruction of the discriminating faculty. And if our spiritual life is annihilated, then we're living a very unbalanced life and we have no chance at achieving balance, at achieving any sacred peace of mind, happiness, fulfillment in life. And here's a technique, a tool we can use to sublimate, to transmute that anger and turn it into a positive, positive direction. Something Abraham Lincoln did, and perhaps many of you use this also. And one of his, during the Civil War, one of his high-ranking officers had either disobeyed or just not understood a command that Lincoln had given him, an order. And his secretary of war was a very emotional fellow named Stanton. And Stanton was just livid, furious. And he told Lincoln, I believe I'll sit down and give that man a piece of my mind. <laughs> he was going to write a letter. And Lincoln, surprisingly, said, do it. Write him now while you have it fresh in your mind. Make it sharp. Cut him up. <laughs> and Stanton didn't need a second invitation, so he did. He sat down, he wrote this scathing letter, and it was a real bone crusher, and so he came back and he read it to Lincoln. And Lincoln said, that's right. That's a good one. <laughs> and then Stanton asked, well, you know, how should I send it to this fellow recipient, this general or officer who disobeyed or misunderstood the order. And Lincoln said, send it? Why don't send it at all? Tear it up. You have freed your mind on the subject, and that is all that is necessary. Tear it up. You never want to send such letters. I never do. <laughs> but he processed the anger. <laughs> he sublimated it, and that was the end of it. I'm sure he communicated with that officer and came to an understanding, but he didn't let it just devolve into anger and then hold on to that anger, hold on to that negation. That was a technique President Lincoln used to transmute his anger. And I heard about a couple, and I love how they used a life experience and used it for years and years afterward to do the same thing, transmute anger. They had been on vacation, and they had come home, and it was like a six-hour drive. The husband had driven the whole way, they were towing a boat behind their camper. They got home. He backed up, started to go into their driveway. And the wife's sitting there and looking at the passenger side mirror. It looks like the mailbox is in imminent danger. And, you know, it's, it's adjusted for the driver, so she wasn't positive, but it, she just said, watch out for the mailbox. And her husband kind of just dismissed it. She says, oh, I, yeah, I see the mailbox. And then he's going further, and it just looks like the mailbox is just in direct line of the boat. And she says it again, repeats it again, watch out for the mailbox. And he was probably a little hangry, moody. <laughs> he was a little grumpy at this point. He says, I see the mailbox, don't worry about it. I've done this dozens of times, I'm not going to hit the mailbox. So the driveway's a little uphill, so he punches the gas, and he destroys the mailbox. <laughs> And she was a very empathetic person because she knew laughing in his face wasn't going to help the situation. 
<laughs> so she jumped out of the truck, ran into the house, collapsed on the living room floor <laughs> in hysterical laughter. <laughs> and her husband could only come in and sheepishly laugh at himself. But they used this experience going forward whenever they were, you know, same thing, or like, for example, doing a do-it-yourself project at home where you can get on each other's nerves. And if somebody started to get hangry or moody or grumpy, all it took was the other one to say, watch out for the mailbox. <laughs> and they knew. They'd start laughing, they'd take a break, they'd have some iced tea, and then they'd calmly get back to work. And we've got to find similar means, similar lessons we've learned from life's experiences, and again, use the power of memory Recall them, apply it, use it in the present, and get our sacred peace of mind back. Paramahansaji said, a person who feels good emotions and thinks good thoughts and sees only good in nature and people will remember only good. Memory was given to you to practice the recollection of good things until you can fully remember the highest good, God. Beholding goodness in everything, you will certainly find that one day the invisible power will shatter all the little windows of thoughts and sensations and feelings through which you have been seeing only glimpses of the divine harmony in creation. You will then behold through an infinite opening the omnipresent goodness, God. So again, to... see only the good in others and ourselves and not obsess on the neg negative qualities, the bad qualities, it's going to take forgiveness. And I think we, it's, important, we can, it's helpful to keep in mind the wisdom from a French proverb which said, write injuries in sand, kindnesses in marble. And I think that's really important toward ourself and toward others. Because, again, we're trying to bring out the best in ourselves, be the best version of ourselves, and we're trying to bring out the best in others. And if we're whole, harboring negative thoughts toward others, as Lincoln once said, most people live up or down to your opinion of them. And I'll just end with this story from Thomas Edison. And they had worked weeks and weeks and weeks in his laboratory, which was a two-story building, inventing the first light bulb. They finally did it. They had the first light bulb, the only light bulb. And he asked an assistant to come and carry it downstairs so they could test it. As he was walking downstairs, that assistant dropped the light bulb. <laughs> the world's first and only light bulb, broken. <laughs> so, but Edison didn't accept failure. He just, found ways not to do things. They didn't consider them failures. So they just went back to work. They worked all night. Eventually, they created the second light bulb. And he called that assistant and asked him to carry that light bulb downstairs to test it. Because he knew developing people, creating an environment to bring out the best in people, was a higher priority than even his groundbreaking inventions. Let us now just spend a couple of minutes. Let us sit and pray for others, and then we'll close with a prayer. Let us pray for the healing of the body, mind, and soul for all those whose names are on the prayer list, who we know who are in need around the world of healing prayers. And let us pray for world peace, harmony, brotherhood, and understanding.
Please stand for the closing prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Bhagavan Krishna, Mahavatar Babaji, Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswar, and our Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, saints of all religions, we bow to you all. Divine Mother, bless all my efforts to fill my mind with angelic thoughts until it becomes as natural for me to think rightly as it previously was for me to think negatively. Help me to use the power of memory to remember only the greatest good, your loving presence within me, around me, everywhere. Om. Shanti, Shanti, Amen.